Delta Airlines Flight 191. On August 2, 1985, a wide-body jet carrying 163 people descended toward Dallas-Fort Worth through rain that looked manageable, but hid something far deadlier. Delta Flight 191, a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar powered by three Rolls-Royce engines, was nearing the runway when it flew into a microburst, an invisible column of sinking air capable of flipping lift into gravity's weapon. In seconds, headwinds became tailwinds. Airspeed collapsed. Altitude vanished. The jet struck the ground over one mile short of the runway, tore across farmland, skidded onto a highway at nearly 200 miles per hour, clipped a car, killing its driver, and exploded against water tanks in a fireball fed by jet fuel and wind. Inside the cockpit were veterans with combat backgrounds and tens of thousands of flight hours. The warning came late. The engines surged. The nose rose. It wasn't enough. The descent peaked beyond 3,000 feet per minute. The ground proximity alarm screamed, and the aircraft never recovered. Of the 152 passengers, 128 died. Eight of 11 crew members were lost. Including the driver on the highway, the final toll reached 137 lives. Survivors clustered in the rear cabin where the fuselage broke away, buying seconds that meant everything. First responders arrived within 45 seconds. Triage began within minutes, and fire was largely controlled in 10 minutes, saving dozens who would otherwise have been lost. Yet the investigation delivered a harsher truth. Crews had little training to recognize or escape microbursts, aircraft lacked onboard detection, and weather information didn't reveal the danger hiding inside the thunderstorm. Martin Air Flight 495 on December 21, 1992, a holiday flight carrying sun-seeking passengers from Amsterdam to Portugal met a storm that would rewrite dozens of lives forever. Martin Air Flight 495, a McDonnell Douglas DC-1030 CF, descended toward Faro Airport through thunderstorm, heavy rain, fog, and violent winds. On board were 327 passengers and 13 crew members, many headed for Christmas vacations. What waited below was a runway soaked with water and air that refused to behave. The aircraft, built in 1975, had logged 61,543 flight hours across 14,615 takeoff and landing cycles. It was powered by three General Electric CF-650C engines and commanded by a veteran captain with 14,441 flight hours. Experience was not the missing ingredient. Timing was. After one aborted landing attempt, the crew tried again, flying into at least two microbursts. Sudden downward blasts of wind that destroy lift at the worst possible moment. Firefighters later reported seeing an explosion 22 seconds before impact. The DC-10 slammed onto the runway with a vertical force beyond its design limits. The right main landing gear collapsed. The right wing tore away. Fuel ignited. The fuselage split in two. When everything stopped moving, 56 people were dead. 54 passengers and two crew members. Another 106 were seriously injured. 284 survived many carrying scars that would never fully fade. Investigators disagreed on why it happened. Portuguese authorities cited an unstable approach, excessive sink rate, incorrect wind data, early throttle reduction, and manual control during a critical phase. Dutch investigators focused on sudden wind shear combined with high descent speed and lateral drift. Years later, new research claimed pilot error played a larger role and suggested critical black box data was missing. Lawsuits followed. Courts debated responsibility for decades. In 2020, a Dutch court ruled the state was partly liable. Pan Am Flight 759 On July 9, 1982, Pan Am Flight 759 lifted off from New Orleans under skies that looked busy but manageable. The destination was Las Vegas. The aircraft, a Boeing 727-235 named Clipper Defiance, carrying 145 people on board. Less than a minute later, every life on that jet was gone. The killer was invisible. A microburst, an intense column of sinking air, slammed the aircraft just after liftoff, stripping away lift when altitude was measured in feet, not margins. The jet climbed to barely 150 feet, then began to sink. Winds that once pushed forward flipped direction. Airspeed bled away. At 2,376 feet past the runway, the aircraft clipped trees at 50 feet above the ground. Seconds later, it tore through homes in Kenner, Louisiana, breaking apart across city blocks. All 145 passengers and crew were killed, along with eight people on the ground, bringing the total death toll to 153. Four others were injured. In the wreckage, a 16-month-old baby was found alive in a crib shielded by debris, burned, shaken, but breathing. Everyone else in that house died. The flight crew was highly experienced. The captain logged 11,727 flight hours, 
the first officer over 6,100, the flight engineer nearly 20,000. There was no fatigue, no mechanical failure. Weather briefings warned of a thunderstorm, yet no severe alerts were active, and the recorded weather advisory was already two hours old. Wind shear detection technology at the time simply could not see what was coming. Southern Airways Flight 242 On April 4, 1977, a routine hop from Huntsville to Atlanta turned into one of aviation's most brutal reminders of how unforgiving thunderstorm can be. Southern Airways Flight 242, a McDonnell Douglas DC-9, climbed into skies that looked manageable but were quietly turning violent. The crew had seen storms earlier that day, nothing dramatic. This time was different. What had been scattered cells had merged into a dangerous wall of weather, and the updates never fully caught up with the reality ahead. At 17,000 feet, descending toward Atlanta, the jet flew straight into the heart of a thunderstorm. Rain hammered the fuselage, then came the hail, so intense it shattered the windshield. Both engines swallowed massive volumes of water and ice. Within moments, they flamed out. Total silence. No thrust. A jetliner became a glider with 85 people on board. The pilots fought the impossible. Restart attempts failed. Atlanta was unreachable. Dobbins Air Force Base sat about 20 miles away, just beyond reach. Altitude bled away second by second. Below, a narrow strip of highway appeared. Georgia State Route 381. With no engines and a broken windshield, the crew aimed for asphalt meant for cars, not aircraft. The landing itself was astonishing. The aftermath was devastating. The left wing struck a gas station, triggering fire and chaos. 63 people on board were killed, along with nine people on the ground. Yet amid wreckage and flame, 22 passengers survived, aided by flight attendants who shouted brace when trees filled the windows and forced open escape paths through twisted metal. The National Transportation Safety Board concluded the cause was stark and unprecedented. Complete loss of thrust in both engines due to hail and water ingestion. At the time, the scenario was considered so unlikely that no airline trained for it. That assumption died on a rural Georgia highway. TANS Peru Flight 204 On August 23, 2005, TANS Peru Flight 204 lifted off expecting a routine domestic run across Peru's jungle skies. The aircraft was a Boeing 737-200 Advanced, 24 years old, with 49,865 flight hours behind it and engines that had crossed continents for decades. On board were 98 people, 91 passengers and 7 crew, including tourists from the United States, Italy, Spain, Australia, and Colombia. What waited near Pucallpa was something few expected. Minutes before landing, the thunderstorm collapsed into chaos. A rare cold front exploded overhead, pushing thunderclouds up to 45,000 feet. Rain turned violent. Hail slammed the fuselage. Winds twisted unpredictably. Instead of diverting, the approach continued. About 10 minutes from touchdown, the jet began to rock hard. In the final 32 seconds, it flew straight through a hailstorm and into deadly wind shear. The aircraft dropped fast. Treetops flashed beneath the nose. The jet slammed into a swamp 4.4 miles short of the runway. The breakup was instant. Fire followed. Burning fuel carved a scar 100 feet wide and nearly 0.9 miles long through the jungle. The cockpit and forward cabin absorbed the worst of it. The toll was severe. 40 people were killed, including all three pilots. 58 survived, many with burns and broken bones, pulling themselves from wreckage surrounded by flames and smoke. Most fatalities were seated toward the front, where impact forces were unforgiving. The investigation dragged on for 312 days. Looters stripped parts from the crash site, forcing authorities to offer a $500 reward to recover the flight data recorder. No mechanical failure was found. The conclusion was blunt. Pilot error in severe weather. A controlled flight into terrain caused by missed procedures and a rapid descent that went unnoticed in the final seconds. U.S. Air Flight 1016 On the evening of July 2, 1994, U.S. Air Flight 1016 departed Columbia, South Carolina, for what should have been a routine 35-minute hop to Charlotte. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas DC-931, built in 1973, carrying 52 passengers and 5 crew. It was a veteran jet with 53,917 flight hours and 63,147 takeoff and landing cycles, powered by twin Pratt & Whitney JT-8D engines that had done this job thousands of times before. The flight stayed calm until Charlotte came into view. Thunderstorms were stacking over the airport, thick and aggressive. At 6.39 p.m., the crew was cleared to land on runway 18R. Rain hammered the windshield. Visibility collapsed. A plane ahead reported smooth sailing, a reassurance that lasted seconds. 
unknown to Flight 1016, a microburst, a violent column of sinking air, was forming directly over the approach path. At 6.40 p.m., air traffic control issued a wind shear warning, but it went out on the wrong frequency. Inside the cockpit, danger arrived without an alarm. The jet suddenly lost airspeed. The captain called for a go-around. Engines spooled. The aircraft pitched up. Then the wind flipped direction, slamming the DC-9 downward. A critical onboard system should have sounded a warning 8 to 9 seconds before impact. It did not, due to a software sensitivity issue while the flaps were moving. At 6.42 p.m., the aircraft hit the ground 0.5 miles short of the runway. It tore through trees, smashed through a fence, and broke into four sections along a residential street. Fire followed. The forward fuselage stopped in the road. The tail ended inside a house's carport. The result was devastating. 37 people died. 20 survived, many with severe injuries. No one on the ground was hurt. The investigation confirmed the cause. A microburst-induced wind shear, compounded by delayed recognition, incomplete weather information, and a system that stayed silent when seconds mattered most. NLM City Hopper Flight 431 On October 6, 1981, a short regional hop turned into one of the most violent weather encounters in European aviation history. NLM City Hopper Flight 431 lifted off from Rotterdam at 5.04 p.m., bound for Hamburg with a brief stop in Eindhoven. The aircraft was a Fokker F-28-4000, barely two years old, with 4,485 flight hours and 5,997 cycles, a young jet by airline standards. On board were 13 passengers and four crew, a quiet cabin expecting a routine climb into the clouds. The crew knew storms were nearby. The pre-flight briefing warned of strong thunderstorms, 1,200-foot cloud bases, gusty winds up to 29 miles per hour, and visibility just over three miles. Nothing unusual for North Sea weather. Minutes after departure, the onboard radar painted heavy rain ahead. Clearance was given to deviate. Then, at 5.12 p.m., everything changed. While flying through dense cloud, the aircraft entered a fully developed tornado. This was not turbulence. This was nature-twisting metal. The altimeter showed a sudden jump, later traced to a violent pressure drop inside the vortex. The Fokker was slammed by forces far beyond its limits. Investigators calculated loads of plus 6.8 grams and minus 3.2 grams. The aircraft was certified for 4G. That margin vanished instantly. The right wing tore away. From about 3,000 feet, the aircraft spiraled downward, breaking apart as it fell. Witnesses on the ground saw the jet emerge from the cloud already disintegrating, followed moments later by smoke and fire. It struck farmland near Myrdijk, just 1,300 feet from a Shell chemical plant. All 17 people on board were killed instantly. A firefighter observing the crash suffered a fatal heart attack, bringing the total loss of life to 18. Eastern Airlines Flight 66 On June 24, 1975, a routine afternoon flight slipped quietly into history's darkest pages. Eastern Airlines Flight 66 left New Orleans at 1.19 p.m. EDT with 124 people on board, cruising smoothly toward New York. The aircraft, a Boeing 727-225, carried an experienced crew led by a captain with 17,381 flight hours. Nothing about the journey hinted at disaster. Then the sky over New York began to change. As the jet approached John F. Kennedy International Airport, a powerful thunderstorm settled over the field. Controllers spoke of rain, haze, and rapidly shifting winds. Visibility collapsed. Warnings of severe wind shifts crackled over the radio. Minutes earlier, another aircraft had reported intense wind shear on the same runway. Still, landings continued. Flight 66 pressed on, descending through turbulent air toward runway 22L. At 4.05 p.m., the aircraft flew straight into a microburst, an invisible column of violently sinking air. Airspeed vanished. Lift collapsed. The jet dropped fast and hard, striking approach lights 2,400 feet short of the runway. Fire followed. Wreckage scattered along Rockaway Boulevard. 113 people died, making it the deadliest single aircraft crash in U.S. history at the time. Only 11 survived, all with serious injuries. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board concluded the aircraft encountered extreme downdrafts generated by the storm. Instrument warnings came too late, and visual cues proved misleading in heavy rain. The winds may have been unsurvivable regardless of crew reaction. Controllers and flight crews alike failed to halt operations despite mounting danger. Lanza Flight 508 On December 24, 1971, Christmas Eve, Lanza Flight 508 lifted off from Lima, Peru, carrying 92 people who expected to be home for the holidays. 
The aircraft was a Lockheed L-188A Electra turboprop heading toward Iquitos with a scheduled stop in Pucallpa. It never arrived. About 20 minutes into the flight, at roughly 21,000 feet, the plane entered violent thunderstorms with severe turbulence. Evidence later showed the crew continued straight into the storm, reportedly under pressure to maintain the holiday schedule. Investigators would later cite intentional flight into hazardous weather as a primary cause. Then came the moment everything unraveled. A lightning strike hit the aircraft, igniting a fire on the right wing. Under extreme aerodynamic stress from the storm and during a maneuver to level the aircraft, the right wing tore away, followed by part of the left wing. The plane broke apart midair and plunged into mountainous jungle terrain, killing 91 people, all six crew members and 85 of the 86 passengers. It is often described as the deadliest lightning-related disaster in aviation history. And yet, one person lived. 17-year-old Julian Copsey, still strapped to her seat, was thrown from the aircraft and fell nearly 10,000 feet into the Amazon rainforest. She survived with a broken collarbone, deep arm wound, eye injury, and concussion. Alone, injured, and surrounded by jungle, she walked for 11 days, following water downstream until she found a hut. Local lumberjacks discovered her and carried her by canoe back to civilization. The tragedy didn't end there. At least 14 others initially survived the impact, but died waiting for rescue, including Julian's mother. The crash ended Lanza's operations entirely. The airline lost its permit just 11 days later.